Matthew chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. Back in the beginning of the year, you may have heard this story on the news. It was all over the place. But there was a young man who owned a business. Just a quick story here. He owned a credit card business. He would process credit card payments and, and so uh, working for the credit card company. And so he was making pretty good money as, as a young man, probably uh, in his early or later 20s. But he had this heart, this motive to, um, to pay all his employees the same amount of money. And so he decided to, to pay everybody in his company $70,000. Didn't matter who you were. If it, he dropped his salary to 70, and then everybody else that was in the company all made 70. From entry level, when you got hired on, you made $70,000. And so his motive was to be equal and fair to everyone. Now that some would call socialism, maybe even communism, you know, to a certain sense. Uh, that will work one day, but it'll only work with Jesus. <laughs> That's the only person that can truly lead and guide us through being fair to everyone. But uh, I just read an article recently that he had to uh, rent his home because he could not afford to stay in it. And so he's renting it and living somewhere else. He's trying to make ends meet because his salary has dropped down to 70000 And he's willing to do that. But it seems like the company's not doing good. In fact, it's doing awful. Because those that were making a lot of money, they got raises, but they weren't very big. You know, may may have been a couple of thousand dollars or so. They got upset. They hear they put a lot of work, a lot of effort. You know, they got educated and, and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, they just get a few, few measly dollars in their raise. So they got upset and started leaving. And then the others in the bottom that were in the center were also getting upset because the ones that were coming into the company were immediately making $70,000. And so the whole company is just kind of uh, falling apart at this moment. But what I want to look at is his motive. What was his motive? I, I think he had a right motive. He wanted to be fair with everyone. I think that uh, he didn't realize that you can't because man, humanity is sinful and, and they're very selfish and self-centered. And so it just won't work. It just will not work. And so we see that failure. And in this chapter, the whole purpose of it is to reveal motives of our hearts, motives of our hearts. As I thought about that, as, we, as I was reading this chapter, I thought that's really what God wants to get at, right? Is our hearts and, and what is our motive when we do things? Not, not just in giving alms, but with anything. I mean, why are we here this morning? Why do we worship? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we pray? Uh, why do we do the things that we do? What's the motive behind it? God really wants us to get behind the motive and get to our hearts. In fact, as we read the whole Bible, that's what it's all about. He wants to, to personally minister to you, reveal your heart to you, and then what is your motive there? When you read the Bible, it's not about your neighbor, your wife, your children. You read it as a personal letter to you from God. And he's speaking to you, and he's asking you to accept it and then to apply it to your life and to allow it to change you. In the kingdom, the motive of the heart is very important to God. That is probably one of the most important things to God is an individual's heart itself. And Christ is going to illustrate that in four ways as we go through this chapter. In our giving, our alms, in our prayers, in our fasting, in our treasures, and even in our needs. What is the motive behind all of those things? It was the, the great preacher Spurgeon who called this chapter the quiet way of the kingdom, the quiet way of the kingdom. And you'll understand that in a, motive, in a minute, especially about giving, because when we give, we're to give in secret. No one's supposed to know. Uh, when we do things, we're to do it with the right motive, and no one's supposed to know why, and so forth. So when he says the quiet way to the kingdom, you know, living that quiet, peaceable life before the Lord. We know that in chapters 5 through 7, we have seen Jesus, the king on the mount, uh, they're preaching the Sermon on the Mount upon his throne, giving his constitution to us. We also know that he's the living king with the constitution for all of his children. In chapters 5, 21 through 48, he has focused on neighbors. You remember chapter 5? And, and, and all the focus seemed to be on others and our relationship with others. But in chapter 6, 
He's focusing on the relationship with God. So what is your relationship with God himself? How is that relationship with him? Uh, Let me take a moment first to say this before we get into these few verses here. That in order for these verses to apply to you, you have to be a giver. You have to be a giver. You have to be giving in one form or another. These four verses apply to his disciples who are doing righteous acts of kindness. And that may include your tithing, your offerings, your services to the Lord, your giving to the poor, uh, your giving to family members, your giving to your children, your giving to your relationship with your spouses, any type of giving, any type of giving at all. Uh, This is what he will be dealing with, those acts of kindness. This morning's theme will be heavenly motive. Uh, We need a heavenly motive. We really do. And we need to pray that God will give us a heavenly motive. Um, We just can't create one. Uh, We can't make it up because I find that uh, sometimes my motive's wrong, right? Our motives are wrong. And, And that's why God has written his word to us to correct those motives. And so when we give, we give with the right motive. Let's go ahead and and read the text, uh, the first four verses there in chapter 6. It says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do your charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in a synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Surely I say to you, They have their reward, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Beautiful text. I love it. It's very clear and it's very precise. Charity is a big business, isn't it? It's a big business. Uh, our s- whole system in, in the United States oftentimes runs on charity. United Way, Red Cross, uh, all kinds of charities that are out there trying to help uh, people out in, in life itself. Government charities, church charities, and there are all kinds of charities. Uh, I- I- even in this community itself, we found with the Summerfest that we put on that there are a lot of charities out there, whether they're government charities or personal charities, who are trying to help people. Met a couple just this last week who were going to join us at the Summerfest, and it's a government charity, social program, that just wants to help families. And so all their services are free to families, from education to parenting skills and so forth. And their whole, whole desire is to create strong families too, which is our model also. And so we've asked them to join us. And, of course, we're very specific that they don't support Planned Parenthood. They don't support this abortion thing. They don't support other situations, which they didn't say they did or they did not, but they wouldn't send people to those places, and I made sure of that. So big charities are big business. Unfortunately, with charities, though, uh, sometimes the motives are not always right. I remember years ago, United Way, uh, when I was supporting United Way, I ended up stopping my support through United Way because we found out that the CEOs were taking a big chunk of it at at the top. And so only a smaller percent was literally being uh, used for uh, those that have a need for it. So the motive really wasn't there in the hearts of some people. And motive is important. I had a supervisor. His name was uh, Mark Ivey. And uh, he was an arrogant man who really needed the Lord badly uh, ran his uh, department with with power and strength and, and force and he wanted everything uh, to be a hundred percent he wanted everything to be uh, perfect and he wanted everyone to know that he had the best division the perfect division the best guys the best of everything that was his motive for doing stuff and when it came around to United Way uh, supporting Uh, He wanted everybody to give because, again, he wanted 100% participation. It was to the point where if you said no, you don't want to give through United Way, you give in other ways, Um, he would come up to you and say, would you mind if I give in your name then? That's how much he wanted to make sure he got the 100%. He was noticed for getting 100% and his name was on the plaque and, and so forth. He would literally vote. Or, not, or he would literally give in your name for you. And I remember when I had stopped giving, he came to me and said, Reuben, I'd, I'd, I'd like to give in your name. And since you're not, not supporting through United Way, I'd like to give in your name. And I says, well, if you give in my name, I think you have to give, give what I, I, I give. 
He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, I tithe to my church. Do you tithe? He goes, no, what's tithing? He goes, well, tithing is 10% of your income. He goes, what? <laughs> you, yeah, that's 10% of your income. He knew what my income was. He goes, wow. So if you give in my name, I want you to give that much because that's what I give. He's like, oh, okay. He goes, he, he didn't, I don't think he gave. So that year he, he didn't get his name on a plaque. Motive is important. We are to be different from the world, aren't we? We as believers and Christians are to have the right motives. When we give, it is only to please who? Our Father in heaven. Nobody else. Nobody else. We should be pleasing him. So let's look at this verse here in verse 1. Take heed, and and let me break up some words here in the Greek and, and give you some definitions. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. When he says take heed, he's saying be very careful here and pay attention. So Jesus is, is, is telling his disciples, pay attention to what I am about to say. This is very important for you, that when you do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward. In other words, no future blessings. If you do them in the wrong motive, there is no future best blessings, no heavenly reward there whatsoever. And it's not going to be reserved for you. It's not going to be reserved for you, which is reserved for you by the side there of the Father. The Father has the rewards for you, and they're sitting by his side, and he is waiting to give them to you. But if you do them in the wrong motive, you won't receive those rewards from your Father in heaven. The NIV says, acts of righteousness. For charitable deeds. Jesus points out that it was possible to give with the wrong motive. You can give, and you can give big, but it could be with the wrong motive. Some people make a public display of their generosity. Uh, they like people to know it, and they like people to see it. Uh, years ago, we had a guy at the church, and he would give, and he would take his money, and he would wave it in the air as they were coming around to collect it. So people saw him, and then he would put it into the bag. You see that sometimes on TBN, um, the Christian network, especially if you gave $1,000 or $5,000. And so again, it's still happening to this day. Um, They were more interested in being known for their generosity than just helping the poor, than just giving. Uh, They were more concerned about their reputation rather than Uh, the relief of poverty. We had a couple here that had come from the wealth and faith doctrine years ago. And when they came here, uh, I don't know if you know what the wealth and faith doctrine is, but it it, it is a Christian doctrine that teaches that God wants you to be wealthy. And the way that you become wealthy is by giving a lot of money. And when you give a lot of money, God will give you back even more. And that's their whole doctrine, which is false. And so this couple came here because they came from one of those those, uh, churches And apparently when they got here, they literally gave so much, they gave more than the whole church together. That's how much they were into this doctrine, which was good for us, you know. But but to sit down with them and and really get to the motive behind it, I asked them, I said, why are you even here? He says, well, we came from that church. And that church, they were so wealthy, they looked down on us because we weren't wealthy enough. Like, wow, and you guys are like giving more than this whole church put together and they're looking down on you. And that's what that system all creates. The motive behind it is about lifting themselves up and being known, you know, but then behind that motive is looking down on others, which is not what God wants us to do. That desire only creates an impress, an impression of godliness and virtue, uh, which is what Jesus is criticizing here. When he says charitable deeds, he's talking about righteous acts or giving to the poor or giving of any type whatsoever, as I said earlier. So he's illustrating an example of, of alms, which is giving, prayer, and fasting. And we'll see that in the, in the few, few weeks coming up. Giving, um, in reference to how we give, that we give to God. And that's important for us to understand. When we give, we're not giving it to the church though you're giving it to the church. You're not giving it to me. You're not giving it to the leadership. You're not giving it to the community. You're giving it to God first. And that's important to understand. You give to him. Lord, this is for you and no one else. And so you make sure they use it wisely, Lord, because they're your stewards and they will be responsible for how they use this. But I give it to you first, Lord. 
Uh, when you give to others out in the street, you give it to the Lord. Lord, this is for this homeless guy. I don't know if he's homeless or not. He could be, he, he could be acting here, but I'm giving this to you, Lord, and I'm going to give it to him in your name. So we need to make sure that we understand that, that our motive is to give to God first and foremost. And then he's going to talk about prayer and again, that relationship of prayer, which we will, we will see next week. Um, when we do these righteous acts, as Jesus said, we need to take heed. We need to guard ourselves against pride. I just want to touch on this real quick because he's warning us there. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Because pride gets in the way in our giving. It causes us to think more highly of ourselves when we should think less of ourselves. And that's a concept that we don't understand in this country because it's all about us, really. It's all about us first. Well, you're taking my time. You're taking my family. You're taking my job. You're taking these things, and I don't want to give them up. And that's not Christianity, because Christianity is about giving up. Jesus gave the whole heavenly realm up for us so that we could have eternal life. And so pride makes us think that we're better than others, right? And that's a, that, that's a very uh, cunning device of the enemy, because we can begin to think, well, I don't have enough to give, and, and, and so I can't because I'm important, and so I shouldn't because my family matters. And, and that's how cunning he is to get in there. And so then he, he basically numbs you to giving, paralyzes you so that you don't give because you think that your family, your livelihood is more important than the act of giving with the right motive. And that becomes pride in your lives. Uh, pride will cause us to be discontent with our circumstances uh, thinking that we deserve more than what we even have. That's pride itself. Uh, we get discontent in the place that we're at. Uh, it may even be in your service to the Lord. And you're serving the Lord and you can get discontent in serving the Lord thinking, I deserve more than this. Uh, this ministry deserves more than this. More attention, more resources, more this, more that. And that becomes pride. And you're lifting yourself up in that ministry up. And it can only cause strife and contention within the body of Christ. Because now you're lifting yourself up above others. So how do we take heed? And this is important. This is how we take heed. We have to self-examine ourselves. Self-examination. Lord, where's my heart in this? What is my real motive? In light of what you said in your word... Where's my motive when I do support you? Where's my motive when I do serve you? Uh, do, I, do I get discontent? Am I angry at times? Lord, take that away from me. Help me not to. Uh, let me not look at people. Let me not look at what they're doing. Let me just do it unto you, Lord. And so it, it is a self-examination of our own hearts and why we are doing things. And then realize, uh, realize uh, the consequences of pride. Lord, this is only going to destroy. When, when I start talking to someone else, about what's going on in the church. When I start talking to someone else about an individual and how they hurt us and then how they did this and how they did that, there's a consequence for that. It, it destroys not only you, but also destroys the church itself. It divides the church. And that is pride. And the consequence of that is you being destroyed, but also the church being destroyed. And you can leave it crippled. You can leave it crippled. There have been people here who have disagreed with certain things that you don't even know about because they've done it in the right way. They just slowly decided they're not going to come here anymore. Then there's been people who disagreed and they let everybody know. And then it just disturbs the whole church for months, if not a year or so. And that's where pride enters in. You may be even right that there's struggles. Believe me, we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God, okay? <laughs> we're not saying we're not sinners. We're not saying we, we, we don't f uh, have faults and flaws. By all means, you might be right, but there's still a right way to handle that. You've got to make sure that you're self-examining your, uh, your motives and realizing that there's consequences for you being right if you're right. Well, who knows, you may be wrong. And in submitting to the will of the Father, to his word, you know, well, what does your word say, Lord? What is it describing to me and how I ought to live my life? And so let me submit to it first, Lord, so that I don't uh, 
stumble the body of Christ. Now, if we are doing our charitable deeds to impress men, look at the next statement, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So our righteous, our acts of righteousness uh, are rewarded by God himself. And God will test them, our hearts and our motives. He's the one that is the true tester. He's the one that really knows our motives. Sometimes I don't even know my own motive. And so I hesitate in doing things because I know that my motive might be wrong. And so like Paul, Paul who said himself that I don't even know if I'm doing it with the right heart. I like John Corson's response and he says, so I just do it and I let God figure it out later because I figure it's better to do something than nothing. You know, and oftentimes we get criticized for doing something because we didn't do it the right way. We didn't do it their way. We didn't do it enough with the zeal. We didn't do it with enough of this or that. And then I look and say, but you're not doing anything. So stop criticizing. At least I'm doing something. I'm trying to do it. And I may be messing up, but that's okay. At least I'm doing something. See, God tests our hearts. Second Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us will appear before God. Each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. God will be the judge as we stand before him, and he will be the one that rewards us. 1 Corinthians 3.13, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. God will take our works, and he will literally put it in the furnace, and he will then reward us by that test of fire. If it's with the wrong motive, it'll burn up. But if it's with the right motive, then we have a reward waiting for us in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3.14, if anyone work, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. And then verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. <laughs> so there are people who are saved that, that do know the Lord, but they have no works or the works that they do have are with the wrong motive, and so they're just burned up. And so they really have no reward when they get to heaven. Jesus really wants to give you a reward. He really wants to have you prosperous in heaven. Jesus said, take heed how you do it. Now we come to verse 2. He says, therefore, in light of that, when you, when you, singular, he's now talking to a personal application. He says, you, he's saying me, do our charitable deeds, those kind things in the Greek is give alms. Do not sound the trumpet before men as the hypocrites. And the hypocrites he's pointing to, those who are in the synagogue, which were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were known for doing this. Don't take your trumpets and don't sound them in the middle of the street. He says that they may have their glory from men so that men recognize them and their reward is right there. Surely I say to you, he says, they have their reward. In the Greek, the preposition here indicates a full payment. Because they did their deeds before men sounded the trumpets and men said, wow, these guys are great. That was the reward in full payment. They get nothing in heaven. I want to make sure that's clear. I, I would underline may have glory from men and then also surely I say to you they have their reward right there. So when he says therefore, in light of the last statement, we have a command now to the individual himself that when you do your charitable deeds, don't sound the trumpet whatsoever. Now, it's interesting because there is a, a historical reference, not necessarily a scriptural reference, to how they would receive offerings at that time. Um, in order to take care of the poor in the community, they would set up these rooms or these chambers. And they were called the Chamber of Secret. And so they would then come and you would give in this chamber. You would drop your offerings secretly so that nobody knew. And then the poor would, uh, would receive their gifts, you know, uh, later on from the Lord, as, as they would say. The Pharisees and the Sadducees said, though, this is not practical. I mean, people uh, are missing out on a blessing. And so what they would do is they would stand there in the secret room. They'd put on their little trumpet on the side. And as the Pharisees saw people coming and giving, and if it was a, a, a whole lot, you remember Jesus sitting with the disciples and he said, look how this woman gave. And she's a widow. And she's how gave. So they're watching you know, these religious leaders. And, and then when they saw someone give, they pulled the trumpet out and just sound it. Doo, 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 and everybody would look, oh, this person gave a big amount of money. And so that was their reward at that moment. And that's what Jesus was saying. Look, you sound the trumpet, your reward is paid in full at that moment. 
Oftentimes in the ancient world at that time, they would have a, a donor's list and they would put it on stone and they would scribe it by the order of how much you gave. We still do that today in churches, right? Uh, I've heard of churches uh, assigning seats with names on it and if you gave a certain amount of money, you got to sit in the front or, or you can uh, uh, donate a plain glass window, you know, the, the panes and all the, the different colors and your name would be on the bottom of the window. You donated that glass window and so your name was there. That's your reward, your name being there and people reading it for years, if not tens of years or hundreds of years, depending on how old the church is, or your name on a seat or your name on the courtyard and you doing this. From time to time, we have people who have come in here and have blessed the church and their whole motive was to just give to God. Uh, this recent, recently, just recently, someone donated $10,000 towards the, the mobile unit. And they came to me in secret and said, look, we want nobody to know who we are. We don't want you to say anything about us whatsoever. We just do this for the Lord and for the children in the church. And so I said, great. That's exactly what Jesus said that we should do. And so nobody knows because they did it with the right motives. And then we have others who had given big amounts, and then they're slowly telling everybody, oh, yeah, I gave that and all there to to this and that. That's the reward at that moment. Be careful. Take heed. They have their reward right now is what Jesus is saying. Then he goes on in verse 3, but when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing at all. Notice the when. Notice when. That's the second example. In the Greek there, the present tense of the verb pictures the act in progress. When you are giving, in the action of giving, whatever that giving is, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing at all. I like what uh, Spurgeon said. Keep the thing so secret that even yourself are hardly aware that you are doing anything at all praiseworthy. Try to keep it so secret that you don't even know what you're doing. Now that's a little difficult to do, but I get his point. And I think Jesus' point here too is not necessarily don't let your right, your left hand and your right hand know, but he's saying do it in secret. Do it in secret so nobody knows that you are giving unto the Lord. Jesus forbid the giver to gloat over how good he is or she is. Don't gloat. A Christian giving is to be marked by self-sacrifice something we don't know of. We had a bunch of guys here at the men's breakfast and I thought it was hilarious because these guys need to learn self-sacrifice. My heart again. Building strong families. How do you build strong families? Uh, Do you just let them continue on the way that they are? No. See, when when a person gives their lives to the Lord and they find a church, they're saying, this is my church. This is where God has me. And I am submitted to the leadership of this church, to the teaching of this church, as long as it's biblical and they're following the word of God. That's what I am submitted to. And so when you're submitted to that, then my responsibility is to teach you the word of God. I'm to teach you how God wants you to act as believers in Jesus Christ. And and these groups of men, we love them to death. We, We love them. We love them all. But there's so much they need to learn. Very rude, very rough on the edges. They come up and we're not even ready. We haven't prayed for food or anything. Uh, they go straight to dessert, start eating everything up. I'm like, wow, we haven't even started. You know, and just very rough edge. This is what God's talking about. He's talking about removing the rough edges, training and teaching and guiding them in these areas. Self-sacrifice. We need to teach self-sacrifice. That's something that we don't teach. We don't teach that. It costs to be a Christian. It costs Uh, to be a husband, to be a wife, to be a child. It costs you self-sacrifice. You have to give up of yourself a little bit. Christian giving is like that. It's marked by self-sacrifice. It has to cost you something. Uh, Self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. You give it and you forget it and you move on. You don't gloat about it. You don't tell people about it. It's not about the self-congratulations, you know. I want someone to congratulate me. Now, I know that, that, that we need that stuff. I know we want to be loved. We want to be recognized. We want people to, to, to see us. I understand all of that. That's the battle that we have in our flesh. 
We need to be content that God sees us. It's a deep, deep motive in our hearts that God is, in, is concerned about. That's what is important. So if you can keep a secret, if you can keep a secret, um, that's wonderful, especially when you're giving. Keep that secret. Let no one know. We like telling secrets, right? It's a great thing. I remember hearing a story of three pastors, and uh, they all decided, Let, let's confess to each other. Let's get the weights off of our bodies. I, I, I hate it when guys do that. Let's, let's, let's confess to each other our sins. Oh, come on. I don't want to confess my sins and faults to you. I do that to the Lord. But these three pastors decided to do that. So one pastor said, okay, I have to confess. Once in a while, I drink a little bit, you know, and I struggle with it. They're all, wow, okay. He goes, yeah, I'm confessing it. I need help, so keep me in prayer. Okay, and the other guy says, okay. Once in a while, I lust. So I struggle with it. I'm like, oh, wow. And then the, finally, the third guy says, oh, I gossip. I have a problem with keeping secrets. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Wrong group of people to confess to at that moment, you know. You want to be very careful. I don't like that. No, just keep a secret. You know, this is your relationship with the Lord. Lord, you know, if you're going to gossip, if you're going to tell secrets, tell it to the Lord. Lord, I got a secret. I got to tell you, Lord. He's that real. Let him know about it, but let no one else know about it. You know, you don't need to do that. Um, that your charitable deeds may be in secret, verse 4, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Who will reward us openly? Our Father in heaven. He will reward us openly. We should never do our righteous acts before people. Now, now, is it okay to? Should we do our righteous acts before some? Well, we have to. Uh, all the guys are serving in the morning, getting everything set up. They have to be doing it in front of somebody. They can't come in at the middle of the night and do it. Who did this? I don't know. It just appeared. You know, no, we have to do our righteous acts before people. But it's the motive that Jesus is really trying to get a hold of, Right? I mean, he was very clear in Matthew chapter 5, back in verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we are to let our light shine. We are to do our good works before men, but do it with the right motive. Now, oftentimes you'll hear me thank Randy, and Randy said, don't thank me, thank the Lord. That's the right motive. Thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for Randy. I thank the Lord for those that serve here. Thank the Lord for those that served at the summer fest and helped out. Uh, some of the smiles were just amazing. The young, uh, I was taking a video of all the game booths and I see all the young youth, you know, serving and they're smiling away. It's like having fun. And I'm like, man, in my heart, I'm like, praise God. I'm like, this is what it's about. It was just wonderful. I was talking to a guy and I'm not trying to, lift you up, but, but here, and I'm not going to take your reward away because I'm not going to point out individuals, but this individual says, you know, I go to a lot of events. They're part of a, a, a band. They go, well, I go to a lot of events, but I tell you what, Pastor, this event that you guys put on, I see people loving Jesus. I don't see that in other places. I see people with smiles. I see people doing it joyfully. They're excited. They, they're loving people. Where in the past, when I've gone to these events, I see people like, Arr, grumbling because they have to do this and they got to go do this. and They're not having fun, but I see Jesus and I see love and I see joy in all the people that you have serving here. I thought, wow, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we got it, that we're doing it with the right heart because we do it unto the Lord. Don't do it unto me. Don't do it unto the church. Don't do it unto the people. You do it unto the Lord. Remember, Jesus is trying to get us to think about our motives on why we do things. And then our Father who sees in secret will reward us openly. God sees everything, right? He's God. Psalms thirty-three, thirteen. He sees all the sons of men. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. In fact, he fashions their hearts individually. Wow, if God fashions their hearts individually, he can change our hearts. You must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. God can change your heart. If he sees a heart that, that needs changing, he will come in and change it, especially when you say, Lord, change my heart. I need to have the right motive. God considers all the works of man, Psalms 139, and he repays according to what he sees. Proverbs 24, 12 says, if you say, surely we did not know this, does not he, that is God, who weighs the hearts considers it. He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? It is God that knows it. 
and he knows our very motives, and it, he will be the one to reward us. We have to ask, how will I be rewarded? We'll be rewarded by the Lord in heaven who will repay us at the resurrection of the dead. Matthew repeats this, and we'll see it again next week, several times about the Father rewarding in secret. In, in verse 6 there he says, the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And then chapter 6, verse 18, the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly again, dealing with those issues. God will be the one to reward you eternally, not me. Look, let me say it this simply and clearly. When you do your works, if you want a reward at that moment, just go tell somebody about what you just did. And that is your reward. It's done. It's over. There's no heavenly reward at all. Whatever it is, if you're in the children's ministry, if you're serving in, in, in one of the service ministries or, or, or you're helping out to, with the cooking and you want to say, hey, I cooked up the real good meal to you. How is it? Is it good? Do you like it? Thank you so much. That's your reward. It's done. It's over. But if you don't, you just serve it and, and you do it joyfully and enjoy it. Praise God. And someone says, hey, wonderful meal. It, you, they didn't rob you yet because you weren't looking for it. Don't look for it. You had the right motive. But if they say wonderful meal, say praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord for that. And he has given me that skill. Because it is the Lord who's given you the skill to do what you do. You have people that have wonderful skills, but they have bad hearts. Because they think they know it all. And they don't. And yet you have people who have bad skills, but beautiful hearts. Because they do it unto the Lord. Do it unto the Lord. Let me close with a story. This biographer, Philip, and I can't pronounce his last name. These guys always have these hard names. Uh, Gadella, G-U-E-D-A-L-L-A. I want to give him credit so he loses his reward in heaven. But um, <laughs> Philip Gadella, who was a biographer, declared that the hardest problem the biographer's face is that of discovering the real person that who they're going to write about. How do they get to the real person that they're going to write about? It is fairly easy, he said, to find out what the subject did, where the subject went, what the subject said, but what kind of person lives in, inside is a different matter. Philip illustrates this point by citing his biography of Duke of Wellington. He came across factual evidence when he discovered Wellington's old checkbook. That's how you can find out. You know, it, it's hard to, dis to, to find out a person's motive. You can guess. Does that guy have the right motive? And a lot of us try to guess what's their motive. Why are they doing it? You know, I don't know why we want to know. That's, that's only God's job. But... How do you find someone's motive? Jay Vermee used to say, you want to see if someone has a, a right heart? Ask them to show you their checkbook. See how much they give, how much they support the Lord. And that will show you their heart. And that's what he was saying here. That he did this biography on this man. And until he found an old checkbook and he saw what was in it, he said, wow, this guy loved to give. He loved to support. Has your heart been changed? What is your motive? Because God wants to get you to a place where you have a heavenly motive unto the Lord. Have a heart for God and God alone, and you'll be okay when you do things for him.